and abruptly as ever, <laughs> we are out. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, that was uh, David Grissom playing at the Saxon Pub. I've got that clip queued up for later. I'm pretty nervous today. I'm very excited to have David here and to do this topic. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kevin, back in Burlington, always did a shot of tequila right before he would go up on stage. I'm pretty sure that if I tried that methodology, we'd end up with other performance issues. So we won't be doing that today. Uh, let me thank BV Ninja for moderating as always. Um, if David and I falter on a question on, on this topic, I'm sure BV as always will save us in the chat. Um, when I posted this question on Instagram, a couple of things immediately happened. I got an email from a loyal subscriber in, uh, in Rome, very excited. And I noticed that he's here in the front row um, about whether or not you should, um, spend money on the amp or the, um, or the guitar. I also got, um, a, uh, a photograph. I'm going to, I'm going to go to it here, uh, from, uh, and I sent it to David earlier. I'm not sure you'd call it approved so much as, uh, reviewed. Um, so this is a picture of, uh, a, a, a slightly younger David Grissom with Storyville and, uh, the subscriber in question is the guy in the striped shirt. They were opening for Storyville. And he would tell you that it was one of the high points at that early part of his career. So we got that picture. Also, Jeff McElane said that David didn't look that happy and he might have been playing backline that day. David will speak to that um, because he said he probably was carrying his own amps with Storyville. All right. So let me go back here and I don't want to miss anything. Uh, so as I said, in the wake of the um, doing the short histories on amps and effects of Jimmy Page and the guitars of Jimmy Page, Honestly, anything I knew about that, I, re I researched and uh, I put in the videos. So I didn't really think a video a live stream about conversation about the amps or, you know, vintage exo echoplexes, et cetera, would be something that really would be my thing. So I thought it would be a good time to come back to the like, so do you spend the money on the guitar or the amp? I mean, I probably I can't imagine how many times they've done this in the magazines over the years. Um, so I was kind of kicking this around. Um, with Jeff McElane. And appropriately enough, Jeff and I actually were on the phone brainstorming, working because we're working on a future episode on Dumble, the history of Dumble amplifiers, of course. And Jeff's connected me with someone that has a, the uber rare Dumble book. I've been out to the community asking anybody if they had a copy of the Dumble book that they were willing to lend. Um, if you guys owned one, you kind of looked at your shoes and were unwilling to lend it. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I got I got my copy of the Black Art over on the shelf there. Um, anyway, uh, Jeff knew a guy who not only had that uber rare book, but has an uber rare dumbbell and he's working on this uh, video with us. And I'll talk more about that in the future. Um, but Jeff was on a roll. I started talking about this topic and I said, you know, who, who could I get to come on? I, I recently imposed on Jeff to be on the stream and he was great and a lot of fun. And he said, I, I think David would do it. And I, and I just sat there and I was just, you know, beyond because as you, you guys know, there was a time if you followed the channel for a while, you know, there was a time when DGT was like the guitar that I played. I actually own three DGTs and a 2010 custom 22 that had a DGT maple neck, really rare guitar. And, and you never see those for sale anymore with three P90s. Um, so anyway, so, um, so yeah, who's, who better to have uh, a conversation with about uh, whether you should be spending money on the guitar or the amp than a guy who's got a signature guitar and a signature amp. And I'm already talking too fast. So I'm going to bring David on to slow me down by uh, by letting me listen a little bit. So let me bring him in here and add to the stream. There we go. <laughs> David, <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. So let's, let's you know, David and I were on uh, testing earlier. Let's go ahead and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and answer that classic question before we dive into other stuff. So if, if I'm a guy and I've got a set amount of money and I'm trying to decide if I should spend more money on the amp or more money on the guitar, what's the David Grissom Bible on that? Well, first I want to say <laughs> I'm getting ready to dig a minefield. I can tell you. <laughs> That's what this is about. Uh, everybody, you know, I've, I've actually been around a couple of other, um, I've had this question asked in the presence really? of other guitar players who I think are good. And there, it, the, the answer varies quite a bit amongst, you know, professional guys. For me, it's the guitar. It's definitely the guitar. Because, um, because you, you tour and you carry your guitar, but when yeah. you tour in Europe, do you have a rig in Europe? You see, you have one of your custom amps there as well, or do you actually backline still, et cetera? Well, I, I've had, I have somewhere in Holland, I have two heads in a cabinet that, with my PRS signature amp. Um, I'm sure there's people on here that would love to know where those are. 
Well, I know, I know where they are. I don't even know if they work anymore. It's been a long time. The last time I went over, I was just in Italy and I used a back, I backline amp every, a different one in every city. Hmm. And I always ask for an AC 30 and we really? can get into that later. Why that did that. But um, yeah, it's just the guitar, man. I, my feeling about that is, is that, that that's what my hands are touching. And to me, so much of my sound. And I think, uh, I think it's true of any guitar player that sometimes beginning players don't really appreciate it as much, but the longer I play, the more I realize the tone really is up to me to get out of the guitar. And so the familiarity with the instrument and um, sort of picking the guitar for, that works for me and what I hear and what I'm trying to get is much more important than the actual amp I'm playing through. Now it's, that's, Having said that, I've had some nights where I've gotten some backline stuff that was just almost painful. Like I toured the first time I toured um, in uh, England and Ireland with Joe Ely, and you know, a long time ago, I got a Roland Jazz Chorus JC One Twenty, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, mean, yeah, power. I made it work. But that's like the antithesis of what you know my fifty watt Marshalls I was using at the time. But well, this my, actually, sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to, you know, I'll, I'll kind of give you the overview and then we can break it down. as. Well, I'm going to bring us back to the question that we were talking about before that we got from Perry, because I'm going to segue this into you. Since you're saying guitar first, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about whether you had that sound in your head or if you had the sound. Yeah. yeah so we'll come back to that. Yeah. Yeah. But my feeling is, is that, you know, we all, I think, inherently were single coil players or humbucking pickup players at heart. I think. I think that's true of most guys I know that have a sound, you know, that have a tone. They they don't move back and forth. If it, if they have a signature sound, they're generally it's you know I, that's kind of how I divide it up. And in the middle is P90s. But I am uh, you know I move back and forth. I mean I'm a humbucking guy ninety percent of the time. Well, almost a hundred percent of the time live. But in the studio, I do play. Um, a lot of single coil guitars for specific reasons. And then, you know, I, when I got my first early 50s Blackguard, that's a very fat sounding Telecaster. It's a, it's really quite a bit different than a 60s or a late 60s or 70s guitar. So it's they're kind of in the same family to me. It's almost a humbucking pickup. And yeah. um, Well, and it's interesting because you spent all this time, you're on record as saying you spent all this time developing the humbucker that's in that guitar. Yeah. That was sort of the classic '59 phrase, Italian, Italian steroids. Yes, and and I know that through the process, like for example, um, there was a pickup that you you said, no, that's too much like Telly, and that ended up in the Johnny Highland model guitar, exactly. for example. So yeah. um, it's interesting that you you very much were living in a world where you were trying to develop a pickup that still was a humbucking guitar, but what had that kind of clarity? Yeah, I you know my issue, you know. When I got my first PRS in '85, it was it was life changing, really, because I'd never had a great humbucking pickup guitar. I had a Strat when I showed up here in Austin, and uh, I had gotten you know I bought a a '59 Esquire at the Ray Hennig's Heart of Texas Music for 500 bucks. I had those two guitars, and um, when I got the PRS, it was like, oh, there's it, there's the sound, there's that fat thing I, I've been looking for all the time, you know, because I mean I hadn't. I didn't have a black art or anything like that at the time, but you know, I'm trying to get that sound out of the bridge pickup on a Stratocaster. It's really difficult for yeah. me to get the sound of Fillmore East or even the first couple of Roy Buchanan records with a Strat on the, on the bridge pickup. So um, yeah, that was life changing when I got that guitar. And I also got a 50 watt or for real 50 watt Marshall at the same time. And it was like, ah, what year was the Marshall? The Marshall was like a 72. It was still hand wired. Mm -hmm. And um, shortly thereafter, uh, I was with Joe Ely and we were in San Francisco playing. Um, it might be where that picture's from. <laughs> because we got all our gear ripped off. <laughs> we, well, well ask, I know the guy. I'll ask him. We got all our gear ripped off. And then we went up and played in Berkeley, uh, whatever that something corner Anyway, Berkeley Square or something like that. And anyway, I had the for some reason that night I had my Fiesta Red Strat and my PRS that I took into my room to change strings. And usually after a Joe Ely gig, we're out really late. Mm -hmm. 
I've been hanging at the bar. It's like last thing I want to do is get my gear, but I want to change my strength. So I took my two guitars in. Well, we got ripped off that night. So that 50 watt Marshall didn't, I didn't have it for long, um, which I soon replaced, but um, yeah. So and yeah, it was a combination of the PRS and the, in the Marshall that really changed. Yeah. Everything. And I, I have a couple of clips from you playing with uh, Chase of Mercury here where you're playing an Esquire and 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 the guitar, I see it over your shoulder because when we were talking earlier, I asked you to pull it out. And you said that guitar's right here. So could you grab it for folks? Sure. All right. So this is the first PRS you ever had. First one. And this is are the original pickups. Original pickups. Uh -huh. um, this is an 85. It's an 85. I did. Uh, I got rid of the. The sweet, uh, I, I sweet switch. The sweet switch and I. And the five-way switch, and just put a volume and tone yeah. thing in there, and it sounded better immediately. Um, okay, but back then I didn't. I, I mean, th this was this was something I did uh, fifteen years ago, maybe. I don't know. And you know, of course, then. So you meant for a long time you played it stock. The I way played it stock the way. back then. I was playing it stock. All right, and and this is an all mahogany guitar. This is all mahogany, and. Uh, you can the non-regulation tuners. I like the buttons. Tuner those buttons. Are, those are really skeletons something. Skeletons on there for a while, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's an eighty-five. I don't know. What, if you what, know. what is it? It's early eighty-five. What's the serial number? Just so uh, that if it ever goes missing, everybody here will back you up. We'll zero three six nine. Wow, three six nine. Yeah, they sold. They recently sold um, zero zero two at a local shop here. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I love, I still love this guitar. I don't want to sell it. I mean, it is this. I, I, I didn't mean to imply it was for sale. Yeah. Well, I think that they're worth, I mean, maybe, oh, maybe oh, I yeah. a thousand dollars off of it by doing this. I don't know. But uh, I think that the fact that you played it all those years and dinged it up yourself probably would offset that. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. I think that the offers will probably start in the top chat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually, somebody, speaking of which, I'm, I said that I'm going to try to do questions, but I know this is going to be really busy. Uh, but uh, Shawnee's a Cubs fan. There's a few something in the top chat. And it's actually germane to this right where we are because David and I were talking about this. If anybody saw, if, if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to go watch David being interviewed on Zach Child's uh, True Town Lounge episode. And the question that, that's bringing this up is, what do you think of Karina instead of Mahogany? I recently saw DGT made a Karina and it had a Brazilian rosewood board, looked amazing. Um, and, and David on that interview actually has a Karina in TV yellow um, that you were playing with uh, Roddy Crow. You were in town to do a run with Roddy Crow, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Karina doesn't have as it's a, it's narrower, you know, it doesn't have the um, extended top or the extended bottom. It's more mid rangey like a mahogany guitar. Okay. So for Rodney uh, it was, it was really good because it fell somewhere between, I mean, it just occupied a nice space. It was again, closer to a telly ish, uh, unbucking guitar than maybe some of these uh, of the other ones it's super light mm -hmm. it wasn't like it doesn't have a ton of bottom end which is can be really good even though i love lots of bottom end but in you know when you're playing with a, a lot of other players and it just sometimes takes up space that you don't need to take up um is there, is there a keyboard player in Roddy's band yeah at the time he's always changing his band up but there was a keyboard player and um uh, Rodney's a really good acoustic player. He was playing a lot of acoustic, and um, I was trying to be on my best behavior and not <laughs> take up too much space. But yeah, I mean, if you found a career to the the person asking the question, if you found one, I mean, I would say, well, first of all, if you can possibly play it before you buy it, that's the thing. Because I mean, you'll if you'll know. I mean, it's very very hard for me to buy a guitar without playing it, or you know, so. Right most dealers will give you 48 hours to make sure it's going to be your guitar. But yeah, Karina ones are real rare and they sound awesome. And Brazilian can be, can be really special. It kind of depends on how it marries with the body and with that neck. Yeah. With, yeah. With the neck, because um, I will, t I will say in, you know, full disclosure here that my experience with Brazilian and new guitars has been mixed because they're kind of down to the stump wood, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, right. unless it's, there are, there are supplies that people have had and held and PRS is a company that has held a lot of it back. Mm -hmm. Had to get it approved for the, whatever the fishing game cities thing. Yeah. Cities thing. And uh, 
So a good Indian rosewood board can sound better than some of the new Brazilian boards. So okay. I... So we're back to play the guitar. Sight unseen, I wouldn't pay a big premium for a Brazilian board unless I played it first. Okay. Uh, we had a question, another top question. And then actually, I'm going to try to sprinkle the playing examples throughout. Um, but uh, Vivas Patil says, uh, can you explain your approach to using the two volume controls? Because it's a unique feature on this guitar, uh, your model guitar, um, and how you use them to get different sounds. I've heard you say before that really 90% of a gig is back pickup anyway. You're living back there. 98%. 98% of it. 98%. I'm on the bridge pickup. And so is two volumes a studio thing? Two volumes is more of a studio thing. Okay. Although, so like, let me grab one that has two volumes. This is just that they had a sh shitty piece of wood and they made this one for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, pull out the semi, the semi hollow PRS DJ uh, because that'll freak everybody out. So a rumor. We're trying to make this a model. We're trying to get them to do it. So that would be amazing. Email PRS and ask for it. Yeah. Uh, actually, I actually, I wrote to Gene before we did this today, and I said, Gene, you need to watch the stream because we're going to encourage people to put pressure on you for different things. It's going to happen. I know my population. I know my community. So we're, this is the beginning of that. So a lot of the the thing that I will do, um, it depends on the night and what songs I'm playing. I mean, I do use the neck pickup because it's, it's really a good sounding neck pickup. And mm -hmm. we, there's been some interesting developments um, that have been predicated by the wire uh, suppliers. And the wire, uh, the thickness of the wire down to the right five zeros and then get, you know, whatever. To, that little amount affects the sound of the pickup. So we had to kind of tweak the pickups over the last year and a half. And I think now there may be the best ever in terms of a compromise between super clear PAF, but fat. Really? Uh, so I will use the bridge, uh, the neck pickup on occasion. And also one thing, a big improvement is the single coil sound on both pickups mm -hmm. is way more usable. Hmm. So, it, you know, there are nights when I'll just in the, in a, I mean, with my band, at least, I try to go different places every week. Yeah. You're, 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 are you mostly gigging a trio or you have a keyboard player often as well now? I have been gigging a trio, trio up until starting next week. And then I'm adding a keyboard player and trying some, trying a little different approach. Nice. So I've been kind of doing the same thing for 11 years. And uh, so <laughs> a couple of new guys that I'm going to play with. And um, um, so what I'll do is I will just roll back. Uh, I mean, it's it can in the studio. It's no big deal at all, but they, they're real interactive. So it's like if you if you roll one too far away from the other, you don't really hear both pickups. Right. So often I will um, turn the turn the this is for the bridge pickup. I'll turn that all the way up, and then turn the neck pickup to about nine, uh -huh. and then with with the selector in with both pickups on. I just get a slightly mellowed down version of this pickup. And it's okay. kind of like that Dickie Betts thing where he, he was quite often used both pickups. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it doesn't sound real twinkly. If that's a, if that's a word, I don't know. It just sort of, uh, it's a little um, kinder version of, of maybe this pickup. And then, so when I hit this, it's not like all of a sudden everything really changes. It just, it's just a little bit more chesty. Like, mm -hmm. A little more like I want it to be most of the time anyway. That's great. But um, I, I can, I can, you know, just turning the volume control down a little bit changes everything and right. cleans up the amp. It's like going back to the amp and turning the, it, yeah. it, it, it's awesome. I, you know. Yeah. And if people haven't seen it, you have a great video that you did for PRS on how you dial, the dial the amp and, and set right. that with your gold top. It's great. Right. I don't want to miss it. Uh, Jeff actually jumped in and, um, and bought one of us an espresso. And I have to think it's for you because he knows I don't need, I, I don't have a, I don't need an espresso. Now at this time, no. What do you mean? Uh, where, like, am I, like telepathically, he's going to send me one? I, he, it's five bucks. So it's going to come to me next at the end of next month. And then I'm going to have to forward it. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. 
<laughs> this yeah. is stress, so it's going to be very complicated. Uh, we got a top chat from our buddy Bill Sanderson um, in uh, is in Nevada right now, I think, and uh, he said he's all in. He's ready to pre-order his uh, semi hollow DGT. Yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah. You know, as I understand it, they're kind of back ordered on the regular ones right now. I'm trying to get them to make more of them. There's just like some dude named John Mayer who's got this guitar that they're they they're making an awful lot of those. They're not making that many of these, or, or uh, these are harder to make or something. But that'll that'll have that'll change after today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Perry is here, uh, my editor. That I, I shared some questions. Perry, I asked David the questions earlier. I've got that, that set aside, but he wants to. They, Perry has a. a Brazilian board DGT. I actually, he bought a DGT watching my early videos where I was playing my DGTs and then I, and then I sold all mine. So, but he bought his, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, so he bought oh, one oh, of you sold all of them. Yeah. It, it was a really hard time in my life. Okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I won't be the this didn't come up before, did it? No. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I actually, know. huh? I know I can I can talk about it now. It, for a while, I couldn't. Uh, no, the reality is, I uh, I was just I was just going in a different direction. I was going more single coil. Actually, yeah. I was kind of going more telly. And the yeah. and the um, the fact is, I don't really regret selling many guitars. Uh, to me, they're it's a, it's a tool, you know. There and I don't I don't play guitar professionally. I don't have the gig you have, you know. So um, the only one I regret is I had a two thousand nine that was a really early guitar, and I actually kind of. I buy into the myth that because Paul kept everybody on in 2008 when the money was so bad and they just had a lot of time to spend on the 2008, 2009 guitars, they're really, that's a, that's a really nice couple of years uh, of PRS. So, well, yeah. 2010 I'm, is to me, that, yes. that's where it all came together. Okay. So I kind of favor 2010 and then the brand new ones. That's great. That's great. That's great. But, I mean, you know, it, again, I really like think that a big part of this whole question, get spend your money on the guitar or the amp, you have to find what works for you. But I would say because, because your hands are on the guitar and that's creating the sound, that would be my 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 focus would be is on spend the most, you know, get the best guitar you can afford and find the one that you feel good about. And if it's not, if, if you feel like there's something else, you can sell it and move on. And if you buy a nice guitar at a good price, you're not going to lose money. Yeah. Well, you know, that's so. Right. Well, and one of my things is I actually believe that, you know, obviously we're in a golden era for manufacturing of instruments. And I've actually known any number of guitars that didn't work for me. And then a buddy picked it up and it was like, wow, that's magical for you. Yeah. You know, the way he 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 hits the guitar versus me, I tend to play really light. Yeah. You and I are on complete and opposite ends of the spectrum for this. Um, I and I think that's a I'm sure there are some dogs out there, but that's a that's a thing. So uh let me let me go to I, I'd want you to talk about when you were searching for your sound though, before okay. I go to the clip. Because I want to go to the, the clip where you're with Mer McMurtry playing that Esquire. Okay. And, and then uh, we'll come back. All right. Okay. Let me, let me see if I can do this, boys and girls. Uh let's see. Here we go. There we go. Another smooth transition. Uh, so, so what, what was that guitar? So that's a 58 Esquire that I bought from Lloyd Maines. And okay. uh, he, I, I sold, I had a 59 Rosewood board that I sold um, just before I got that guitar. And then I got that one and he sold me the, that guitar in a Tweed Deluxe for 800 bucks. And, um, <laughs> So this is a good thing to, this is a good um, example. The 59 slab board, you know, yeah. in theory, it wasn't a top loader, it, you know. Yeah. Every, so everybody knows that a slab board is fatter than a maple neck, right? I mean, sound, sound wise? Mm -hmm. No. Not that one. 
this 58 killed mm. 59 slab boards. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. I was going to say, is it is it behind you there? No, no, but I have other ones that I like better than the 58. But, okay. but it, it 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 again, you know, it was just like the 59. I tried it, and it was like real shrill hmm. and then i got this 58 and got it refretted and i used it on tons of stuff i used it on another um he's on a bunch of records and then i did an austin city limits with john mayall and played that esquire oh yeah that's the clip i was actually looking for yeah was, so you're playing that i thought maybe you were sitting in with mayall but that was planned and you were playing your guitar were you playing your amp on that clip i sat in that night on one song right that i i, I did i did a record the record that came out right before that show. And I was, I know what I was, I can remember exactly what I was playing. I was playing a red 50 watt head into a 412 that I have in that room. That's been my main cabinet for 30 years. And I used a Brown Fender reverb tank and a TC electronics booster. And that was, that was a magic sound The tell, you know, like a fat telly, and then you go through the reverb tank, it kind of melt, it kind of warms things up. Yeah. And then you hit a really nice warm Marshall with 25 white greenbacks that are really like mid rangey. And then the basket weave grill cloth takes off the super high end stuff, which is, I'm always running from too much top end. <laughs> I'm laughing because you're so clearly getting more excited as you do your signal chain. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, like, it's like, I wish it had all that stuff sitting right here in my room. But I mean, even though I have stuff that's as good or better, I want that stuff back, you know, right. it's like, that same stuff. Right. And it's like, you know, when it never fails, when you sell a guitar or an amp, it always sounds better. The minute it walks out the door, it becomes a better amp. Well, I've actually said in videos, because uh, that's very anti-channel, by the way, thank you. But uh, the, I always say that if you decided to sell a guitar, the last thing you should do is sit down and play it before you pack it. Cause you're going to go, Oh, I got to take that. I got to take that ad down. That, that, yeah. What am I doing? It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's there for a reason. It, you have it there in the house for a reason. So yeah. Uh, Guppy Bill says he gets to hang out with the cool kids at five white world today. I don't know, Guppy, we probably made you sit in the back probably. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so go back and talk about, um, uh, talk about chasing your sound about when you, 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 you came into town. You've told this story lots of times before you came into town in Austin, you showed up with a Fiesta red strat. Was it 63? You, you still have it, right? 60. Yeah. I've got it 60. Right, 60. Right, behind, right behind me. I have it. Yeah. Not on the stand, but in a case. Right. right. Um, yeah. I paid 400 bucks for it. I bought it in Memphis, Tennessee in 1980. And, uh, that's what I showed up with here. And, um, Every guitar player in Austin, it seemed like, was playing a Stratocaster. Uh, you know, a couple of tellies, but mainly Strats. And what year, what year is it? Well, mine's a sixty. No, no. What year is it? Then? Oh, what year? I got here in '83. Okay. I was. I think I still had to use a fake ID. There you go. That's uh, right. right. But uh, so I, you know, I just saw that everybody was playing one, and then one night, some guy said to me, "If you don't play a Stratocaster, you ain't shit." you know, the National Guitar of Texas. And, you know, I was like, immediately some sort of intuitive thing kicked in <laughs> that uh, says you need to get a different guitar. Right. And I had been chasing, you know, the, the, and I've talked about this a lot. So, but it's, it's just undeniable. The two things that I point to that I was trying to get were a hybrid of the, Roy Buchanan's Blackguard Telly on the first two records. Like the Vibrolux turned all the way up with a lot of reverb. And Dwayne Allman at Fillmore East, that more harmonica, little Walter fat thing. And they, to me, they were both really fat, but they both were really clear too. So I was always chasing that. And I never owned a humbucking pickup guitar until I got the PRS. And so again, as I was saying earlier, man, you know, I saw the ad in, in the I mean, guitar player, it's this thing, Seafoam Green. It's kind of vintage approved. It's got a vibe. I'm going to go check one out. And I drove to Dallas. There was a dealer that had one and fell in love with it. And um, that's that guitar you brought at home. That's that guitar. So I, you know, I, that 59 Esquire with the slab, slab board, I traded for that. But the dealer wouldn't let me have the hard shell case. <laughs> he took the 59 Esquire. Because they weren't work because they were just old guitars. In 1983. Well, it was worth, he had a 59 telling, he was all excited. He was going to have a pair. And I'm like, dude, really? You're not going to let me have the case. Right. I, think I had to buy the case, you know, uh, but it was a thousand dollars for the whole package. 
and the case was a hundred. So I had to come up with a hundred bucks. I, I traded the 59 Esquire and a hundred bucks to get that guitar, but it changed my life really. I mean, it was that in the 50 watt Marshall and then the, and the, the equal, if not the mo most important part of the equation was I was playing with Joe Ely and he said, he just said, man, go tear it up, you know, do what you don't, do. Don't hold back. And it was like, you know, I learned, so, I mean, the, I learned about dynamics and not like playing everything all at once and in, in learning how to play ballads and how to pace a show. And, you know, again, the Lloyd Maines who played pedal steel with him before was a big influence on me, that overdriven pedal steel thing. And so I was able to kind of approximate that hmm. with, with the PRS and the Marshall. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Uh, Aziz wants you to know that he's going to come over from Dallas and be looking for you to sign his DGT at the show at the, at the Saxon. I imagine you do a lot. You do you do that a little bit, I'll bet. Yeah, there I do it all the time. There's I no mean, barrier. I'm like down on the I'm on the floor after the show with you know <laughs> winding up chords with and, yeah. and people are hey man, what you look like a lot like a lot like a guitar player after a gig, huh? Yeah, yeah. No no roadies. All right. Um Buzz Wilson says, David, I got to see you in Waco with Joe Ely back in the eighties. Remember that tone like it was yesterday. Have your local Tuesday gigs started up again? They're going to start this coming Tuesday. Uh, this coming Tuesday, everybody. You're going to run the place over. Be coming out the doors. So that's a perfect segue to having, if I can bring up the clip, same show where you were playing that Esquire. I've got a clip of you playing the Seafoam. And so same amp, different guitar, and uh, same, same band. Uh, so let's see if I can do this here. Bending with a capo. You're, you're, you're crazy, man. <laughs> I always, people ask me, how do you do that? And I'm, I just, my answer is use the force. <laughs> and it's, it, and too, you know, uh, it's the same thing with bending with a tremolo, a floating tremolo, doing pedal steel things. You use the force and um, you, you need to learn to do it. And the secret really, if I try to, if, if there's one secret is to not hold on one note too long. If you're bending, you know, I mean, like, Get there and get away, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's because obviously if you. It's not too bad on a PRS, you know, it doesn't really. I'm, playing, I'm bending the second string up and the, it's changing pitch a little bit. But the, th the secret is to kind of. Get, get there and get away, huh? Get there and get away. <laughs> That's the a trick. Thing, the capo thing, when you bend something and, and it gets caught in the capo, a lot of times I'm real quick, I'll pull it back down. And, right. uh, yeah. you know, but yeah. it does actually keep me from doing certain double stop, bend, you know, because I know that it could get caught and then I hate being out of tune. Oh, I was going to say, because actually in that interview with, um, you have a great uh, obsessive compulsive moment in that interview with Zach, where you tell a story about being in a control room listen to parts back in a control room and going, um, that other guitar player is out of tune. And this producer's like, what? I, I don't, he's like, no, 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 that part, can you hear it like vibrating and stuff? And you make it sound like I, I got to go get a Coke or something. I got to leave the room. I can't listen to this. It's hard, it. man. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. You know, when That's things so are all in tune, I mean, you know, it's like there were certain old records where things weren't in tune, but that was a cool thing. But now that we're laying layering all these parts and things are denser and there's less bleed, you know, I think the bleed softens all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's stirring everything together, right? Yeah. The more parts that we're adding in without that bleed or that ambience, mm. you, to me, I just hear it more and uh, comes thrumming out at you, huh? And you know, I can tell you that in session world, if you're doing a lot of sessions, you have to be perfectly i mean you have to be in tune and that that really comes down to the importance of having your guitar set up properly and actually knowing how to do a little bit of setup work uh, or at least identifying if a string is you know the culprit is 90 percent of the time is in the nut 
And it's generally, it's, their string is hanging in the nut or the nut is cut too high. So that when you fret on the first fret, it's going to go sharp. And those things, you can't get past it. You right. can't. It, it, if it's not a proper setup. It cannot, you, you can't use it on a session. I mean, I, I can pick up a guitar. First thing I do is just play an E chord to feel, you know, and I've, I've worked for, I worked for a client on a, on a pretty long project that had a lot of amazing vintage guitars and I would pick them up and I'm like, can't use this one. Can't use that one. And, you know, it's just because whoever set them up, mm -hmm. who I think was someone who was, you know, he fairly well known. And I mean, maybe maybe I'm doing something wrong. I don't know. But if I do know that that the, the you, if you're not in tune, you don't get hired back. There you go. What else you got to know? Right. So let's uh, let's segue. You think this next clip that I have is from. um a, uh, a special show on Austin City Limits, and you're taking a solo, and and um, I think people will probably recognize the guitar you're playing. And let me run the clip, and then I'm going to have you use that to segue to talking about your amp. And because okay. because okay, the guitar is the most important thing to David, but you spent all these years building your own amp. So let's mm -hmm. go let's go to that next clip. So this is uh, you're playing in a big. Uh, people will see. There's a lot of people on stage here at this clip. There you go. So, what, so what do you think you're? I, I noticed the sea foam is there. I didn't notice that before. You know what? That that's not that sea foam. That's oh. <laughs> I have I have a DGT with two P nineties. Oh, really? Yeah, and I never play it. It it weighs like nothing. It's like it's featherweight. Mm -hmm. Then the two worst sounding DG the only two DGTs I've ever owned that I didn't bond with were the two lightest ones uh, you said that before it yeah be too light um but that why, yeah that, why'd you have it that night then um because it had something to do with i think um it, actually it's a nice guitar it sounds good okay it, um now you're selling it i was doing a thing with bonnie Raitt and uh this thing this song called non on it that she did with roy rogers this who used like some sort of really funky uh gold foil pickup thing or whatever so i was just kind of going for a more honky mid-range uh, okay uh if i remember correctly i may have used it on some other stuff too it was a real rootsy night and uh yeah i i think that i, I brought it like uh, for that reason i think and when we when we talked about that before i showed you the clip because i was saying in the comments earlier that i literally was pulling these clips together in the last 20 minutes before we were supposed to go on um you're holding that semi, but you told me that you think you might've had, you have a special, they built for you a DGT uh, custom 30 as a combo with a 112. Yeah, I could see it. It was, that's what would, that's what I used on that. It's yeah. the 112 combo version of it. And I used it. I mean, I use it like when, when I really have to kind of watch my volume and I can still bring my own amp. Like I used it. I played with Robert O'Keen and we used it at the Ryman Friday night and, uh, I mean, I had it down, the master like down to two and, you know, baffle in front of it, still loud as shit. But, uh, it, you know, I've, I've got somebody took some clips from the crowd. It sounds great. I mean, oh, great. Great through the PA, but I've done that uh, ACL Hall of Fame show where they induct people. And I think that's the only time I brought my own amp. And every other time I've just used whatever was there for backline. Okay. And, and um, you know, it's not as good as bringing my own stuff sometimes. But other times, if, it, if I get the right, if you, you get lucky and you get a really great AC30 or up this year, it was like a Blues DeVille or something, uh, 212s. Mm -hmm. It sounded great, you know, but that's what it comes back to for me. It's like, I want to bond, I got to bond with this thing. You know, I want to be able to coax everything out. I don't want to be feeling like, oh, the neck's not the right shape, so my hands don't feel comfortable. I want to, you know, another really important thing for me is the height of the string off the guitar. Hmm. So like I like a Les Paul that has a, like a brand new Les Paul with a real sharp neck angle and the two pneumatic bridge is like this high up. My hands are in a completely different location. Huh. Um, 
if if that's all you're playing and that's the way what you like, that's fine. But for me, um, I just want to bond with something. And to, I can this this it, people don't talk about this that much, but think about it. Where your hand rests and relative to the body in terms of the, how you pick, what I found is that the the most tellies, SGs, old three thirty fives. They all they all kind of sit at about the same height. Hmm. It makes the transition much better for me. But again, you know, when you're thinking about spending a lot of money on a guitar, I would think about all these things and try to spend time with the instrument. But this is what my hands are touching. And this is how I'm making the sounds with my hands. So it, before we go to the amp, though, you touched on something I've heard before, but I, I've never had a chance to ask you. Um, is the dish, is the carve of a DGT top different than a regular custom 24 or 22? Do you have more space to rest there a little bit? Well, it's not that I want more space, really. I don't want okay. too much space. I like it low. Oh, okay. I like it lower. And you uh, want to you, I don't, I don't, you dig I, in and yeah. I don't know. It's just so, just, just the way I rest my hand. And also the way I mute on the thing, if it's too high up, then my wrist is at like this, this angle. Mm -hmm. Whereas like this way, yeah. I can really... I don't know. Can you hear that? Okay. I mean, can you yeah, hear yeah. when yeah. I'm muting and yeah. see like right there. Uh, it's all I'm muting here to create yeah. sound. I mean, it's, there's no pedal that does that, you right. know, right. right. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, do you still use 11s? Do you got 11s on this guitar? No, these are 10 and a half, so I've, I've moved down. Oh, I've, you, you moved have, to 10 and a half across the board? I have been using, since the pandemic, I've gone to 10 and a half. I'm, I've given in. I just I'm <laughs> not being out playing gigs that much. Yeah. Um, you just not, you know, you just hand strength? And it's hand just, strength. Yeah. And also, I was finding that, um, well, they sound different. Yeah, and it's sometimes, you know, tens. The it, it's it's weird. Like ten and a half for people that don't know that Diodari makes a set that's ten point five to forty eight, right? And as, so it's in between a ten to forty six and eleven to forty nine. So it's you can feel the difference, but it, it's to me it's a really nice compromise, especially with the scale length. I use tens on Fenders, ten to forty six. Even some Gibsons that have lower frets, I'll use, you know, like old guitars that haven't been refretted, I'll use 10 to 46. But um, what I, you know, I just felt like, like sometimes I would be soloing up higher and knowing that that, that was an 11, I would shy away from. <laughs> yeah, you're shy already. Right. Some of those high, higher bend. Hmm. I mean, that's on the 22nd fret all the way. There you go. And with an 11, that becomes a little harder. And yeah. there's still enough There's still enough uh, tension here where I can play slide if I need to play slide. And it... I mean, it sounds like an acoustic guitar. Yeah. Know? I mean, yeah. it's like it's this guitar rocks. I mean... The other ones, even the solid bodies, will will ring like that too. Well, so. so so talk about. You said that when you're out on the road, your backline request is an AC30, mm -hmm. and um, and I imagine they vary wildly, like everything else. But yep. when you went to build your 30 watt amp, your amp, because I I know you have a 30 and a 50, but you're really you. I've heard you say many times that you use your 30. What percentage of the time? Always. We just oh, oh. discontinued the 50. Oh, no kidding. Okay. So, so what is it about your 30 that is a step in what direction from a AC 30? It's a, it's a step towards a JTM 45. Okay. It's a step away from the, uh, chimey, you know, you can get, you can get the chimey or voxy thing. There are enough, if you, it's not a very complicated amp. I mean, I could, if you sat in the room, I could show you in, three minutes, how to go from a super chimey blackface or a chimier Vox thing to JTM 45. But like a really good AC 30 will do that too. Like mm -hmm. a, like my vintage one 
but you really have to watch the top end. You have to dial the top end way back, use the top cut. Um, it's still more mid rangey and Britishy to me than a JTM 45, which is essentially a tweed baseman. Right. Um, it does kind of get into the land of, of a Plexi 50 a little bit, but you know, this is a, uh, you probably can't see it, but I have a JTM 45 here and I was playing them last night and the JTM 45, it just has this creamier thing than the solid state rectifier 50 watt, even the Plexis. And there's a great guitar player on Instagram, Eddie Tapp, and he nailed it the other day. He was showing his JTM 45 and his Marshalls. And he said, you can make, a later, like a, even a metal front hand-wired Marshall, more like a JTM 45 by turning the middle control down. And that's something I've done from day one. I see people always cranking the mid, mids way up. And if you, man, it hurts, it just hurts. And so I, I never run my middle on either the PRS or any Marshall that's not a JTM 45 past four. And it, you can hear, you can just hear it, all that grit, the grit, the mid-range grit come out. Um, on the PRS, the mid control is not as high up. And so you you can turn it up. And on, and that's one thing about a high watt is that mid, the mid control on a high watt takes it from like blackface fender to, to British uh, overdrive. And that's kind of that, you know, when we were sitting down developing the amp, we were looking at a Tweed Deluxe, a Plexi 50, a high watt, a Park 75, that's kind of, those were kind of the four amps. And the thing we that I really asked Doug Sewell, the designer, to draw out was the mid control on the high watt and showing, you know, showing him what it would do. Hmm. And, and to sort of contour the high end response to the Plexi 50. And uh, uh, I don't know, it, you know, it, to me, it's the one, it does, it's the most versatile amp. And the reason I use it in the 50 had so much low end and it had, you know, these amps want to be cranked up. Although I found out this weekend that you can crank the master way down and it, it, but then you got to crank the volume way up to get the overdrive because you're substituting preamp distortion for output distortion. Right. But when, when I play live, I'll use the 30 and turn the master all the way up. So it's the tubes are really working. And then lately I've just been putting my pedal board case in front of one speaker to kind of calm down the, you know, to take the volume down a notch. And it's, it's, you still get, I get the tone and mm -hmm. it, the people in the front row are happier too. But, yeah. but, you, so, but when you, so when you play the Saxon, you're not tempted to take the 112 though. You just. No, it sounds different. I mean, uh, I like the low end. Mm -hmm. Even when you're covering up one speaker, the, the, the 212 cabinet that we designed has these circular uh, opening in the back that has basket weave grill cloth across it. I mean, right. they, I don't know what we were thinking or what, but it, it allows the sound to spread out a little bit hmm. and at the same time, calm it down a notch. But so, yeah, it's the bottom end that I get. And also the, with the bigger cabinet, there's a little more compression so that my hands are able to, I can manipulate that little bit of compression with my hands. You just feel it. I mean, and if you do, if you, if all this sounds like Greek, if you were to play with the amp set up the way I'm talking about, I think you would feel it in a heartbeat. Like I'm speaking to people that are listening right now. Yeah, yeah. And if you're all a, players, right? a lot of the players that are listening go, I know exactly what you're talking about, but some, some people that have not had the opportunity to, to, crank it up and do that yeah. we'll see what i'm talking about and then it becomes um an exercise in are you just going to turn the master way down or are you going to put stuff in front of the amp or are you gonna you could go to a 112 um well in the comments before uh before we got on um i told the guys that the down at ish guitars which is a prs deal or a big wood library kind of place that they have one of your amps right now and every time i go in the guys just like they just tease me they're like because they know that I used to have DGTs and they're like, Hey, did you want to plug in this when you're here? I'm like, don't, don't get near me. I don't want to plug into that. I'm not yeah. plugged into that. Amp. I'm not going there. Not, that's not happening. Let me run the last clip because we are at about 10 of, and this is you playing at the Saxon uh, with your, um, with your rig and your amp. So let's see, where are we here? Here we go. I had to, I apologize to everybody. These clips are short because the software streaming software choked when I put the length clips I wanted to have here. Probably better that way. No, I, 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 I could see David in the green room and I was running the clip coming in and I thought, oh, I should have thought of the fact that I'm playing this guy's live solo 
Wiley has to listen to it on the on the lead in. So this is a piece of that. The end of the solo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Latin. That's my Latin thing. Your Latin moment. It's yeah. a, a rumba. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. With some fun changes to play over. It's it's basically a kind of a blues, but it's got some cool, you know, fun chords. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let me go back. That Those are the clips, boys and girls. Let me go back and see if there's some questions that I missed here. Um David, when did you move to your to your your uh, custom amp? And you were doing Marshalls still till the, till before that, right? Yeah, I did Marshalls, and I still have Marshalls, but I don't use them that much anymore. Um, a, they're they're louder, and it's harder for me to. I mean, I'm I, I just feel like man, thirty watts turned up really loud is loud, and it's a beefy thirty watts. So uh, I started kind of inching away i mean in storyville i had a matchless and oh, really yeah and i would a lot of times i would run it through a 412 like the the dc 30 but i would bring a 412 and so because mm -hmm. the the matchless can was kind of with 212s and the open back was kind of poofy you know like it would kind of just like fart a little bit and the bottom end would be kind of flabby and so i would run it through a 412 uh and then i used uh some bad cats about and i found oh, I remember, right a bad cat panther that's right, right. right. Four, I used, six, four six v sixes four six v sixes and i just bought another one i'd sold them all and i bought another one off of uh, a friend of mine um is it one of your old amps coming back no it's not okay okay not, but i had it gone through and it sounds just like um i remember the first channel on that amp is garbage <laughs> <laughs> useless. First channel is useless. It's all channel two. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking. Huh. And it's it's not like you it's not usable for me. That's not an amp that you helped develop or anything. No. No. Okay. No. But the second channel is man. It's 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 like you know Malcolm Young, uh, magical, which moment. is not that overdriven. You know, and I, right. that's something okay. I really like. Um, yeah. When we were working on the page video, Jeff um, was, you know, he's trying to incorporate the fuzz and stuff for the playing clips. And he's like, every time he was unsatisfied, he just turned the gain down. Yeah. It's like, I'm just pulling. I just got to pull back, you know, to come back. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get too off tangent, but I'll, I will say that the, the thing I see all the time with beginning and sometimes intermediate guitar players that are struggling with their tone or their delays are too mushy on the front side of the amp. It's all a gain issue. Mm -hmm. They've got the gain up too high. Mm -hmm. And that, so that'll cure a lot of ills. If you can turn the gain down and get the output section to break up a little bit or use pedals, mm -hmm. um, but too much gain. Like if you're running your master at one and your preamp at 10, you probably got too much amp. Yeah. Um, so I moved through, you know, a lot of those different amps and then PRS started to make amps and they sent me some stuff and I gave them lots of feedback, which I know is comes as a shock to anybody who knows. <laughs> what a surprise. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and then we started making some other amps and then um, I, you know, they were, they were making some, they started making some amps that I was really enjoying playing. And then, I got the opportunity to work with Doug Sewell and I don't know when it was, but it, it was, it was a while ago that we started working on this amp and it took about two years. Um, I want to say 10 years ago, hmm. maybe it, if not, more, yeah, it may be more, but yeah, 10, I would say like a, 10, 12 years now. I want to say I was using it on, I was using a prototype of it when we first started the Saxon thing. Okay. So right around that time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I want to give a shout out. Carolyn Shulman is a singer songwriter. She's in, in the chat. She used to live in Austin and uh, she's a great singer songwriter. Everybody should check out her channel. Um, and she said she saw a lot of great shows at the Saxon uh, when she lived in Austin. So that's really cool. It's great to see other musicians swing through the thing. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff went home. Jeff like bought the espresso and left. 
So I can't see the chat. I don't know if anybody said can't see the chat. Oh, you could just open. You could have just opened a window. Long I should have told you a long time ago. Uh, you could just open a a, um, a YouTube a session of the thing, and you can see the chat. Then you're, the you're assuming I know how to do that. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm a luddite. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, we got five minutes here uh, left. So um, so if somebody's doing it, your your advice is the same, whether sort of regardless of price point. Yes, it is. And I would say I would, you know, I would look at your budget if you have if you have such a thing, you know, yeah. if like you're trying to buy them both at the same time or you have yeah. a plan down the road. Um, I think there are combinations of guitars and amps, depending on your like if you have a thousand bucks, you're going to be hard pressed to get both. Mm -hmm. But if you have three thousand bucks, maybe over the course of a couple of years, there are, are great guitars at the thousand dollar in you know, eight to eight, 800 to a thousand dollars that are really well made by, you know, PRS has a line, you know, Fender, I played some Fender. Uh, I don't know whether I think they're, do they still do the Mexico made in Mexico? Yeah, I think it's like the Ventura stuff now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of that stuff is great. And it, you know, if, if there's an issue with it, um, a tech can really, you know, if for for $80 can dress the nut or make a new nut and then maybe touch up the frets a notch and then it's good to go. I have had issues and I, and I will caution people um, and I don't really want to talk spe too specifically here because I don't want to uh, be I don't want to offend anybody. But I have seen some examples recently because I've had them in my possession of some very expensive guitars by a big guitar maker. <laughs> who uh the neck the wood is is bad and i mean i couldn't get the neck to be you know it was it was too much bow on the when i got it right on the treble side there was too much bow on the bass side and then i'd get it to where it was kind of a compromise and then i came back two hours later and the first string was sitting on the first fret i mean so you can't be careful <laughs> Just because it costs a whole lot of money doesn't mean it it's better. Um, and so I just, you, you know, just I think the first thing is like, do you want single coils or humbuckers? If you have one guitar, what do you gravitate towards? Mm -hmm. And then work backwards from there. And then amp wise, I mean, I've played a Pro Junior on gigs, a Fender Pro Junior or a Blues Deluxe. I think some of those lower price Fender amps are killer. Yeah. I've got this silver tone here that, I bought from off eBay for four ninety five. That you said it's sitting on top of a ten thousand dollar Marshall. Yeah, it's sitting on top of ten thousand dollars forty five, and I use them both about the same amount. And uh, great, it's great. Um, the fun part of the fun and part of finding your own voice is to sort of maybe turn off a little bit of the outside chatter for people telling you what you should get, and go out and just go to stores and play some stuff and and. Right. Uh, you know, like if you if you if there's a guitar you're thinking about buying and you know a player that plays one that you respect, reach out to him. Yeah. And say, hey, what do you think? Is this model cool? Or do you think uh, here's who I like? I mean, you can ask questions. I mean, I try to answer all my emails. It's hard to do sometimes sure. when, you're, when you're working a lot. But uh, to me, I mean, uh, the, to, to address the topic again, I think there are it's easier to, to make an amp, like a bad amp work with pedals. And the thing, like for instance, a silver face uh, Fender that's been like an in a, a, a rental amp forever, where the the speakers are all chuffed out, that's a hard thing to overcome. So in that situation, I would recommend turning the amp down so that you're not hitting the speaker that hard, and then use pedals to try to get your overdrive. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is people under, underestimate the value of the, the importance of the speaker. You can take a cheaper amp and, a, and a, like, for instance, and you can take a, a black face or a silver face fender that has the stock speaker in it and put a Celestian in. And then you've got like, you've got more headroom, more bottom end. Yeah. Um, it's filled out the mids a little bit. Yep. It's got the mids. It's not as scooped. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's again, what, what sound are you going for? Yeah. I got a couple of quick questions here because we were really literally were down to the last minute. Somebody's asking in the chat, Kevin Carrick wants to know if there's ever been conversation about a PRS SE DGT. Yeah, there, we're having that conversation right oh, now. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. And um, and Jeff wanted us to know that he has been here all along. He was just uncharacteristically quiet. That Unbelievable. Is, I editing, is he okay? I, I think he is okay, but he's here. So he'll hear your question. I'm sure he'll reach out. 
Because right. I know you're, because you, I'm sure your concern is is, um, is sincere. I'm, I'm always here for you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, Oris Durburn just says, thank you. And that's my segue to say, David, thanks so much for doing this. It's, yeah. it's a thrill. We've actually exchanged emails over the years, but we've never talked until Jeff made this happen. And I really appreciate Jeff for doing that. I really appreciate you for doing this today. Uh, people, I, I wasn't, I apologize. I wasn't able to do questions in the chat to the extent that um, I, I wanted to, but at the same time, I think everybody really wanted to hear David's um, uh, opinions about these subjects. So thanks again. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks to you and Jeff both. Thank you. Great. Very much. All right. Yeah. Thanks again. I'm going to check you out here and then say good night to everybody. There he goes. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for turning out. I really appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, that's who, who knew we'd ever be able to have David on the channel. That's, uh, it's one of those things where every time I make a video, it's that much more exciting that we're able to include these things. So, um, thanks to you everybody. And, uh, I'm going to, I, it's kind of a smooth day, right. For technology, at least from here. Uh, so, uh, I'm sure we'll do a mic drop on the way out. So take care, everybody. Bye-bye.